Cherry Bomb, debatably Tyler's most controversial album in his entire career broadening his sound by creating songs outside of his listener's comfort zone, choosing to pursue a musical direction more akin to genres like neo-soul and R&B. Tyler had already started experimenting with these sounds more heavily on his previous album Wolf, with songs like Tree Home 95 sharing a lot of elements that would reappear in this album. Dog, when you get that finished product, it's all worth it. As I've mentioned on a previous video, this was the period where Tyler started to become more ambitious and creative with his music, and decided to stray away from any music that would simply pander towards his fans' expectations. That is except for the track Buffalo, which Tyler claims that he regrets making, and is his least favourite song in his entire discography, purely because he says that he can hear how hard he's trying to pander to fans, and go back to an older style of himself, purely to not disappoint fans. If you could take back one song you made. Buffalo. When I made Cherry Bomb, I said, damn, <clears throat> they're going to probably hate all these songs. Let me make one that's kind of sounding like Tyler. And the, the, even the delivery, I just hate it because I know it was forced. And I know it was for a reason out of me. It was for. You was were for doing them. it for, for what <clears throat> not normally it. what you just. It's not what I wanted to do at the moment. I was doing it for fans because I knew that album was going to probably throw them for a loop. And I hate that song, and I wish I didn't do it. And I didn't Upon the album's release, it's quite understandable why Tyler seemed to be so cautious and worried about aspects like his new musical direction and fan expectations, as when the album came out, it appeared to be Tyler's most negatively received album to date, by not only critics, but perhaps more surprisingly, his fans, both hardcore and casual. Man, I'm not, I'm nothing right now. You yeah. felt that way coming off Cherry Bomb? Yeah, 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 because everyone hated it, except for like, real music level yeah. who cares about drums like i opened a rap album with a punk uh, a rock song yeah most niggas is like uh and then buffalo comes you can barely hear what i'm saying then pilot come and it's this 80s music so they're out because they want rap then run comes doom, doom, they don't know and then find your wings come and it's like okay this is chill then cherry bomb just punches them so they're out and a lot of people didn't know how to take it so well like find your like, wings and stuff felt like uh and I don't even mean lyrically, I mean like sonically, it sounded more personal to you. Again, going back mm -hmm. to like your love of chords and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you were on Cherry Bomb, like it seemed like you would have and like distort it. Like mm -hmm. it was like you're always kind of running from it and like mm -hmm. covering it up. So that's saying it's your most personal album removed from the subject matter. It feels that way, like yeah, sonically. I fully get that. This is the main reason why the album is so controversial, because over time there's been a noticeable change in how Tyler's fanbase perceived Cherry Bomb, and I personally believe this is due to the releases of his next two albums, Flower Boy and Eagle. I'll be honest, I think it's a more than understandable viewpoint for someone listening to Cherry Bomb that after listening to all his previous albums, Tyler's sudden change into what appears to be a drastically new style may come as a shock, and may seem like Tyler has lost his way. It's bright and happy, it focuses much less on rap, its production is varied and experimental, however has a heavy emphasis on neo-soul R&B, but also rock and pure distortion in parts. With all this being said, we can now look at Cherry Bomb as a transformation and evolution of Tyler's core sound, and due to how everyone perceived him at the time, was looked at as a regression in his sound, as opposed to a progression. Tyler is fully aware of this, choosing not to ignore this negative reaction, with him mentioning mentioning several times about how deeply this reaction affected him mentally, and how it made him feel tied down to one sound. Cherry Bomb's also the only album of Tyler's to later get a deluxe edition, including all of the instrumentals. This was a decision made by Tyler for the same reasons listed before, and he explained this in a tweet. He says, Nope, I thought Cherry Bomb wasn't appreciated, and it seems that the instrumentals are giving that album a different light. People are finally coming around to it. Most listeners initially hated it, but there's some gems on it. Anyways, with the context out the way, let's get into arguably Tyler's most ambitious release to date, Cherry Bomb.
Going into the first song, Death Camp, Tyler sets the stage immediately with the spiking distorted guitar being present from the second the track starts. Contrasting this with the intro to his previous album, Wolf, it's pretty much the complete opposite to Wolf's angelic and free opening, creating an immediate off-kilter atmosphere. He starts off the track talking about his ever-growing fame and recognition, but also showing us that he isn't thrilled with the prospect, asking if these people can turn down the lights that are brightly shining into his eyes, as well as stating that he doesn't particularly like all the cameras that are pointed in his direction. As this first verse proceeds, we can see that the message Tyler is choosing to promote immediately at the start of this album is somewhat similar to what we saw in the song Colossus. Tyler's becoming disillusioned with the fame and recognition he's developed throughout his career, and although he doesn't want to be rude or a nuisance to anyone, the feeling of being the centre of attention constantly and being told things like how he can't wear his hat at certain points of time is starting to piss him off. Tyler then starts reflecting on the doubts other people threw in his direction before he had gained the fame he has now, saying that people used to make fun of his vision, but those same people are still paying off their tuition fees, while Tyler's paying off a mortgage on a new house that he's just bought. He continues to essentially brag about his position in society, compared to his naysayers, saying that while he's been making plates, representing the musical format of vinyls, they have just been washing the dishes for a low salary. This would also represent how Tyler is providing these dishes, ergo his music, whilst everyone else is simply consuming what he's producing, with the doubters having to clean up the mess after the fact. This first verse seems to have this contrast where he starts off shy and withdrawn until he's pushed to a certain point and just explodes, fitting quite well with the title Cherry Bomb. Tyler stays on with this theme of washing dishes, saying that he wants these people to get the fuck out of his kitchen, meaning to stay in their lane and let Tyler do what he does best, but to leave their ego behind so that he can look at their opinions and ridicule them. Tyler then begins to elaborate on the following he's managed to establish from the albums that he's created in the kitchen, or rather the studio, and starts satirically embracing the kind of labels that are thrown onto his fans, like minions or cult followers, and states that it was his aim to brainwash all these people into his way of thinking, not being part of the old school or new school, but in fact his own school entirely. All of these lyrics are obviously satirical, and are said purely to get a reaction out of critics and sensitive listeners, which Tyler only reinforces in the next lines, where he says that he hopes these offended listeners are angry, pissed, and offended at the things he's saying. To some people, he may continue to purposely infuriate listeners by claiming that Nerd's album, In Search Of, inspired his creativity and ambition a whole lot more than Nas's Illmatic, an album which is generally considered to be one of the most groundbreaking, heavy-hitting, and influential hip-hop albums of all time. To some avid hip-hop fans, this may seem like blasphemy, especially considering the drastic difference in popularity between both albums. However, for a Tyler fan, it's very clear to see why Tyler has this opinion, as the influence from Nerd's discography is much more present within Tyler's work than anything that appears on Illmatic. In the upcoming lines, Tyler uses clever wordplay to put his confidence on display, as well as distancing the things that he produces, such as music and clothing, from any of his contemporaries that claim to make stuff anywhere near the quality of what he produces. Tyler states that he isn't cut from the same fabric as other people, perhaps referring to other people within the rap industry, but it could also be even more broad and braggadocious, saying that Tyler is on another level entirely compared to anyone. In the next line, we can see where Tyler gets this mindset from, as he makes a key point of saying that unlike other people, he has 100% of the control in everything that he creates, whether that be music, clothing, or videos. We know this is true, with Tyler creating his own brand, Golf, as well as most of his music being self-produced. By mentioning these factors, Tyler not only distances himself from these people that took the easy way to success by spending money to become successful, but also flexes his own creative, original, and adventurous approach to pretty much everything, which costs less time, money, and outside involvement, an aspect of Tyler's creative process that I'm sure would be envied by many of his competition, that aren't as inherently creative creative and original as Tyler. Tyler then acknowledges the grand change that he's taking on this album, using wordplay yet again to convey this. He first compares the hard style he's already taking on this album to someone coming out of the closet to their conservative Christian father, an analogy referencing the anti-gay views that are commonly believed to be shared by conservative Christians, and comparing that hardship with the hardness and grit of his lyricism and production. 
Tyler then goes on to say that with the reputation and acclaim he has now, as well as the huge amounts of money that now circulate around his several business ventures, there is a lot at stake, so one would assume he now has to be more careful with whatever he's releasing. It also means he has to consider aspects like his style and brand, and what is considered to be consistent with what he's made in the past. However, this prospect doesn't phase Tyler with his progression as a person, as well as an artist, as he states that he's morphing. This of course being in relation to his change in style on this album, however may also be implying some foresight towards Tyler maturing as a person compared to his more outrageous attitudes when he first gained fame. After this, Tyler claims that he named the album Cherry Bomb because greatest hits would have sounded boring, an idea that still holds true today, with Cherry Bomb arguably being one of Tyler's personal favourites in his discography. This leads us into the final part of the verse, which again focuses mainly on Tyler doing his own thing, despite being told to be careful and take certain actions that contradict what he wants to do. He claims that he doesn't like to follow the rules, and when he gets told he has to, he still doesn't back down from what he wants to do, claiming that he doesn't have any armpits, meaning that even when realising what he's doing is against the status quo, with a lot being at stake, he doesn't sweat or get anxious because of the sheer confidence he has in his decision making. It's like in this final moment of the verse, he's being spoken to by an interviewer, asking him questions like who's in charge of this golf shit, where he then replies, I'm the sergeant, signifying his authority and ownership over the golf brand. He shows a complete lack of care towards all of these situations, which is a theme running through this entire track, not bowing down to anyone's expectations and simply doing what he wants. However, at the end, Tyler takes a brief moment of reflection, talking about how he's cold-hearted and unaffectionate, perhaps due to all of the events in his life that have led him up to this point. We then get taken to a bridge, which simply reinforces the message Tyler was already promoting in this song, claiming how he doesn't like to follow the rules. We also get a bit more of an introspective look on Tyler's perception of fame, looking around at other rappers and telling them to give themselves a hand, despite Tyler not really thinking they're cool or worth anything substantial. This leads on to Tyler telling these same people, as well as possibly himself, to pose for the camera because it's their life for the lights, camera and action. This is referring to the aggressiveness that was shown in Tyler when having to interact with these interviewers and people outside of his comfort zone. These are factors that should be considered not just by Tyler, but everyone who's creating stuff that will be shared on a broader scale. Aspects like interviews and fan interaction that you may think you have control over become mandatory at the helm of some sort of contract or agreement that you inevitably come up against in any area of media, and especially within the music industry. Tyler can't deny that a part of him started off his career with an aim to become famous and be able to do whatever he wants and not worry about money. As he says though, this is the life he signed up for, so it's hard for him to feel sympathy for any of his contemporaries who are making an actual issue out of these things. I think these lyrics also set a rocky precedent for a typical artist's life, basically setting their lives foundation on their success and recognition from the media and fans, something that we've seen time and time again, especially in this age of cancel culture, is a very unstable foundation to rest your entire life on. Tyler ends off the song with an outro, repeating the phrase welcome to death camp and giving off similar lines to what we've already analysed from the previous lyrics on this track. We can see by the end that the death camp Tyler is referring to may very well be the music industry and the things he's been forced to do despite him not wanting to. However, the death camp could also be even more broad, referring to fame in general and how Tyler has become wholly disillusioned with the idea of fame and is starting to get confused with aspects surrounding it, such as worth. This leads us into the second track, Buffalo, the track Tyler infamously has claimed is his least favourite track in his entire discography. I believe this distaste towards the song has a lot more to do with the actual delivery, however, and what the song represents to him personally, feeling trapped by his fans' expectations. The song starts with a sample of Bunny Sigler's Shake Your Booty, before bringing us straight into our first verse, with Tyler immediately setting an off-kilter tone with his delivery. It's a definite change of pace from Death Camp, with a darker tone being present, more akin to his previous projects, as well as his vocal delivery being similar to how he portrayed the character Sam in his album Wolf, really amping up the raspiness of his voice. 
He starts by saying he can't wait to see the look on people's faces, perhaps referring to his listeners' surprise at the switch up in direction that he's already taking on this album, but maybe also setting us up for some of the details he's going to drop in this track. As Tyler mentioned in this tweet, Buffalo is cool, I just had to actually address some things. Listen very close though. One of the first instances on this track where we can see Tyler addressing something specific is when he references Mountain Dew and how the people who run the company are racist. Tyler has this opinion due to the advert which he helped create for them involving his friends and a goat called Felicia. All right, man, we got them all lined up. Nail this little sucker. Come on, which one is he? Point to him. Uh, it's me. You should have gave us some more. I'm nasty. Keep your mouth shut. No. Keep your mouth shut. No. I'm gonna get out of here and I'm gonna do you up. The advert was pulled by Mountain Dew after it received multiple complaints referring to the racism and misogyny that was apparently present in the advert. Tyler comments more on this situation on an interview with Larry King. Who exactly is Felicia the Goat? Um, I did this commercial. I did some commercials with Mountain Dew, and that was the main character, and I just ran with it. A, a, a commercial product hired you to represent them? Yeah, and they were sick, and then uh, someone that named Boyce Watkins uh, decided to see that and saw some negative stuff in it, decided to write an article, and then simple-minded people who can't think for themselves decided to all agree with it, and then Mountain Dew didn't want any bad light on them, so instead of backing me up or, you know, standing up for me, knowing that it was no type of negative light, they decided to back out and just let me be and be there alone, which it worked out for the best. I'm so grateful that that happened. Tyler then uses the metaphor of a green vegetable, this time being cabbage, to represent the money that he's gained from making music. He has done this before, most prominently in the track Domo 23, where he refers to money as lettuce. The grander point of these upcoming lyrics could be in large part referring to not just the controversiality Tyler has come up against throughout his entire career, however could more specifically be mentioning his infamous ban from the UK, which happened around the same time this album was released, and was only lifted in 2019. Acknowledging this controversial atmosphere surrounding him, Tyler decides to sarcastically pander to his critics, claiming that he'll change certain words that offend them at their request. But in the end, it doesn't really change anything, because if the meaning and intent is still held, no matter what word you replace said offensive word with, it will still convey the same message. Tyler then proceeds to touch on religion in this same context of controversiality around his persona. He's mentioned this on several songs before, essentially spelling out to his listeners and critics that a lot of things that he says in his lyrics are simply for entertainment and not his actual beliefs. However, he's still held up to this offensive standard. Aspects that continually get picked on are his homophobic slurs and incessant ridicule over religion, with some even going as far to call Tyler a devil worshipper or Satanist. Tyler obviously thinks this is ridiculous, saying, I pray to God when the six triple book bashing, while me and my favourite author's lips tickle. Obviously in this context, the book is still referring to the homophobic slur, however the next line confuses Tyler's message by saying that he's kissing his favourite author, that while it may be referring to a female author, the way Tyler introduces this lyric, almost as a counter-argument to his critics, makes us think that Tyler is implying that he's making out with another man, completely diffusing any sort of homophobic accusations that may come Tyler's way. We can see Tyler's firm belief in the powerlessness of words. Tyler has stated lots of times before that despite him saying all these things, he'd never actually act on them, or even believe them himself. Whatever he says in his art, he's entitled to say, and is simply a form of personal expression. You don't place so much importance on language though, because I, like, I know you have friends like Frank Ocean, yet I've heard you use the F word. So Yeah, you, you, well see, that's the thing. We live, it's, it's another thing. See, that's just a word that you could take the power out of that word. It's to the way that I see things, it's your it's you chose to be offended if mm -hmm. you care more about stuff like that. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that might sound very ignorant, but if someone uh if, if you're a black person and someone calls you an N word and you get offended, maybe I don't know, maybe you might be. But if I know that I'm not a N word, which she told me not to say, which mm -hmm. I really want to say that word, 
I'm not going to get offended because I know that I'm not that. So mm-hmm. you, I'm Frank, Frank's gay, and he, I use that word all the time. He doesn't care because right. he, knows, he knows me. He knows when I say that word, I'm not thinking of someone's sexual orientation or anything. It's just another word that has no meaning. Yeah, and when you use the N-word, it, it doesn't mean the same. Yeah, anybody, anybody could be that. I called the white dude in the back of N-word earlier. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he got nervous. Call them white people. <laughs> Call them white people the N word. They get. Nervous. Tyler continues on this subject for a while, hilariously taking the media's views on him and blowing them even further out of proportion. In lyrics like "Tyler the Creator, fucking kill you with a popsicle." However, in the upcoming lyrics, we see Tyler mention how he's sick of making other people money, especially when they don't show him anything in return. He does this by mentioning the clothing brand Supreme, a brand which was seemingly synonymous with Tyler when starting off with the Supreme brand being one of the standout trademarks of Tyler as an artist. However, over time, Tyler wore Supreme much less, most likely due to his tastes naturally changing and maturing with age, but also down to aspects like his golf clothing line, which was just starting to take shape around the release of Cherry Bomb. Tyler explains in the next lyrics that due to Supreme not showing him anything in return outside of some free clothing, for the obvious amount of attention he brought towards their brand, he's not going to promote them anymore. Claiming that he wishes he would have been more business savvy at the time of Supreme's initial publicity so that he could have made lots more money off the brand. Towards the end of this verse, Tyler yet again strays back into this braggadocious attitude, however in a more understandable light, especially when considering all of the strife he's been put under already as mentioned in this track. He decides to weigh up his options, acknowledging all of the negatives that have come into his life after he's become famous, but this time pairing them up against his positive achievements, such as buying a mansion, becoming the frontrunner to a new generation of rap, and as mentioned in the last line, even with the boatloads of attention he's garnered from fans, a larger majority of people are still watching the throne, referencing Jay-Z and Kanye West with their album Watch the Throne. However, this matters much less to Tyler, as these same artists who are much larger and more recognisable than Tyler is right now, are the same artists that are actively interested in what Tyler is doing and wanting to collaborate with him. Of course, just to prove Tyler's point, two large inspirations, Lil Wayne and Kanye West, both appear later in this album. This leads into a bridge, with radio host Shane Powers being introduced on the track, seemingly shouting things in Tyler's direction like, do not fuck this up you have the whole world in your fucking hands. It's a strange inclusion to have on the track, essentially putting even further pressure on himself to please his fans and not ruin any sort of public image or legacy that he's already garnered throughout his career. Although Shane Power's delivery is aggressive, looking at what he's saying, it's a definite shout of encouragement towards Tyler, telling his listeners to get their wings flapping and follow Tyler's journey as he's about to spread his own wings and fly, transforming into the best possible version of himself that he's managed to attain in his life up to this point. The inclusion of this segment may also be appropriate foresight from Tyler, knowing that only two tracks in, this album is going to already have some of his critics and fans shaken, and not in a positive fashion. This leads into the second and final verse, where he once again becomes more introspective, straying away from the larger media perception towards him, but how he perceives himself, and how he's currently living his life. He says that he wants some mirrors to be brought out because he's starting to get lonely, referencing how he's envying some sort of connection with someone on the outside of his barrage of self-empowering views and lyrics. However, because Tyler is the only person being reflected back in these mirrors, he's still only seeing one perspective, which is his own, leaving him in the same predicament as he started with. He then takes aim at social media and the toxic climate that revolves around most platforms, which has only gradually gotten worse over time, with cancel culture in 2021 currently being one of the most prominent aspects of social media that is despised by many a user. Tyler says that the likes, apologies, and snaps make it obvious that most people are just craving for attention and want to be cared about, even though they haven't done anything substantial enough to warrant this degree of care that they're searching for. 
Tyler hates these social media platforms with a passion, as they've established a certain culture, particularly within youth, that encourages people to yearn for attention and require validation from other people, as opposed to just having this confidence within themselves. It's a very mature mindset to have, seeing the superficiality of apps like Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook, essentially exposing these narcissistic and egotistical people who envy those they perceive to be greater than them and posting pictures or comments trying to get what they perceive to be a sufficient amount of validation, praise, or even just recognition. Tyler mentioned this in a tweet around the same time Cherry Bomb would have been recorded, saying you all just want instant gratification off other people. So you Snapchat real quick so people will see your weak ass story. I've fully seen people only do stuff to just put it on Snapchat so other people could see it, not because they actually wanted to do it. Tyler ends this track off repeating these same ideas, ending off the track by asking why has nobody got their hands up and stating that that's the issue. Getting frustrated at what things like social media has turned our youth into, with everyone being so afraid to be themselves out of fear of judgement from any outside perspective. This leads us into the next track, Pilot, a song which leads on from what Shane Powers had mentioned about spreading your wings and flying. It opens with the banging of some tom-toms, before a huge wall of distortion floods the track, along with Tyler's vocals. The instrumental has this dark tone to it, which is contrasted with the rather uplifting lyrics at the start, reinforcing the message of self-belief and self-confidence, not being tied down to other people's judgement and expectations, but instead being who you want to be in your yourself and being happy with it. He continues this same sentiment up until we see him mention a brand new camera and a parachute, the camera serving as a metaphor essentially for Tyler's maturing mindset, claiming that he's got a new outlook on life and sees things more clearly than he once did. The mentioning of this parachute is also important, implying that whilst he's currently the pilot, taking flight and finding his own ambition in life, if he were at to some point crash, he would be able to use the parachute to land softly on the ground, obviously representing how if Tyler's plans and ambition were to blow up in his face, he would have a backup plan and be happy that he at least tried to do something outside the status quo. He ends this verse off speaking to his contemporaries yet again, trying to put them in their place if they ever tried to compare themselves to Tyler. As he says, we are not parallel. We can see Tyler's self-belief is on another level, truly believing that any rappers trying to either jump on his vision or strive to get to the levels that Tyler is already at are simply foolish and should sit back down in their seat whilst Tyler flies all of them to their destination. We then get a short instrumental break in between the first and second verses. A juxtaposition is made in this segment, toning down the distortion and following a smoother, uplifting melody. In the context of the track, looking at the verses where Tyler is hitting us with a barrage of opinions and thoughts on how he sees himself and others around him, we could see those as the turbulence in this plane journey that Tyler's taking us on. Then in this break, we hear only an instrumental, lifting us out of the stormy turbulence and letting us peacefully rest rest for a while and take in what Tyler has already discussed on the track. However, as we come into the second verse, the distortion comes back in full force, with Tyler immediately picking right up where he left off, saying that he's so far ahead of everyone else trying to compete with him that he's in fact in the future. This sentiment is held yet again, pretty much through the entire verse, although towards the midpoint of the verse we hear Tyler become introspective, referring to himself as the turbulence boy, to describe the shock and awe that Tyler can bring simply by being who he is. The comparison between Tyler and Turbulence does hold a lot of merit, with Turbulence being a normal occurrence in plane journeys, much like how Tyler's outrageous antics have become much more expected as his career has progressed. However, despite Turbulence being a normal occurrence, to those unfamiliar with it or are prone to panicking about it, the effect that this Turbulence will have could still make a huge impact on a large amount of people. Just like how Tyler's sense of humour and attitude can be embraced by a huge amount of fans, but still land him in hot water when it comes to the overall media landscape, with the opinion of him and how controversial he is as a person varying due to numerous factors. He ends this second verse off toying around with the idea of crashing the plane he's piloting into a building, thinking of it as trying to do parkour. We can see more clearly here that Tyler is essentially using this idea of a plane as a metaphor for the new school of rap and how he feels like he's seen as the captain of it, being the frontrunner of a new generation of artists. 
However, as we've seen already, Tyler doesn't like how all of these passengers on his plane are trying to compete with him, and even attempt to get on his level. So this time, threatens to crash the plane entirely, in turn bringing an end to an entire generation of rap, simply because of his actions, which he knows for a fact will make an impact on everyone. Yet again, Tyler does this to show off his power, and overall importance in the grand scheme of the rap industry, whilst also showing us that despite him gaining a new outlook on the world, he hasn't lost any of his confidence or bravado. We then get brought to a refrain, where the instrumental yet again transitions to a calmer, less distorted style. Tyler repeats the phrase, I don't want to crash anymore, several times here, making a complete contradiction to what he just said in the previous lyrics about wanting to crash into a building. This could be implying that much like a lot of other things that Tyler has brought up in his lyrics that previously got him into trouble, he's either putting on a front with this self-confident and braggadocious persona that he's instilled on himself, or perhaps in this moment came to a greater realization realization about what he wants in life, having his new set of eyes be opened up even further, and his vision on his future endeavours be completely clear. It's also understandable from an age perspective, with Tyler starting off his rap career as a teenager, releasing his first actual project, Bastard, when he was only 18. We've seen him gradually progress over time, not just in relation to the quality of his music, but also him as a person. By the time this album was released, Tyler was entering his mid-twenties, already deep in the process of becoming an adult, so it's understandable that Tyler simply can't keep doing the same things he was doing when starting off his rap career. One, because it would be tiring to do the same thing over and over again, which with Tyler's ambitious and creative mindset would never be a direction he would take, but also two, Tyler is just just naturally maturing and moving away from the actions that he used to take and how he used to act. I doubt Tyler would still want to act as outrageously as he did when he first entered the rap scene, but even if he did, I'm sure he would be aware that once you reach a certain age, if you still act the same way you did essentially as a kid, it pretty much becomes embarrassing for everyone. In the bridge, Tyler uses clever wordplay once again on this album to take a step back from his braggadocious attitude and focus more on his actual feelings, and how becoming an internationally known artist has impacted his emotions. He constantly repeats the sentiment of how he knows he's in first class, but it still feels like he's in coach, and that this prospect feels strange to him. Here, of course, Tyler is using the idea of plane seats to represent his life and career, acknowledging that he's managed to garner enough attention and money to be considered a first class flyer. However, with aspects like his tough childhood with the abandonment of his father, the multiple school changes he had to face attending over 12 different schools within the Los Angeles and San Sacramento areas, as well as how he's still genuinely quite young and new to the music industry, Tyler still has this closer relation and understanding of people who are below him in the grander scheme of the economy. Tyler ends this track off by first claiming that he's trying to find a place to land, again referring to this greater point that has emerged towards the latter half of this track, feeling that the fame has suddenly become too much for him, especially with his currently volatile and developing mindset. The irony, of course, is that Tyler has fell right down the path he mentioned on Death Camp, about how when releasing his music and choosing this career path, there was obviously an aspect of him that envied the light's camera action. So running from it at this point is both very difficult, but also futile, as he's already made a name for himself. What he needs to instead do is rationalise his situation and find a way to cope within the current environment he's found himself in. Tyler then goes on to mention the things he thinks you can and can't buy in order to stay cloud level. The term cloud level obviously meaning keeping your attitude and mindset on a high. Tyler says that you can buy materialistic things with money, and states that you can even buy your way to happiness, a viewpoint that I'm sure would be largely contested. However, he caps it off saying that the one thing you can't buy is wings, an impactful lyric showing that all of these things that you can buy are simply temporary, giving way to quick thrills and enjoyment. In spite of what large corporations and incessant advertising says should make you happy, the only way to true happiness, enlightenment, development and evolution within one's mind is found within themselves. Everything else is simply dampening and getting in the way of this positive transformation that can be made within anyone. The final thing we hear in this track is Tyler saying, I don't wanna, which leads us right into the next track, Run. <laughs> The song starts off with rapper Schoolboy Q aggressively asking why this person in question is running. 
We can presume this person to be one of the numerous amounts of people brought up surrounded by gang culture, thinking that if they partake in activities centered around drugs or violence, that it will make them be perceived as more cool from an outside perspective. This is somewhat similar to the message Kendrick Lamar employs on his song You Ain't Gotta Lie, another song revolving around the cultural norms in these gang infested areas. Whereas that song is more about how the actions of these people in question reflect on the general perception of black people within America, as we enter the first verse, we can see that Tyler is using this topic to look into people's deeper insecurities and lack of self-confidence. He starts off this first verse acknowledging the incessant drug use that people partake in, this first type of running being one that takes place within the mind of a person. Taking drugs can most easily be described as an experience that elevates your emotions to a level that they weren't before, aka you're on a high. Tyler is well known to be straight edge, so simply looks at these drug users as people who aren't happy in their own skin, using these substances as a way to run from themselves and suppress who they really are. Tyler then focuses more on violence within gang culture, using a car as a metaphor for the speed someone is moving through life. And in the case of these gangbangers Tyler is referencing, they have manipulated themselves into thinking their choices are achieving something meaningful, or that it's making them progress as a person. The irony of this mindset is that of course, the truth to this situation is that all the actions that these people are taking are simply hurting others around them as well as themselves, making them be seen as a bad individual to be involved with and more impactfully, keeping these same people in this confused and detrimental mindset. Tyler continues to chastise these type of actions, calling them lame and mocking the idea of someone trying to be intimidating or powerful when threatening someone with a gun that they get out of the back of their car. This same idea is employed through a large part of this verse, continuing to focus on the ill thought and brash actions that these people surrounded by gang culture take, with Tyler mentioning how he thinks it's a shame that they've kept themselves trapped inside this small and overall meaningless box, with Tyler also claiming that if they wanted their name to have some weight or have some sort of notoriety in the eyes of other people, they will gain that from the actions that they take. However, it will all be stemming from wrong and negative actions, again, reflecting poorly on them as an individual. It's also noteworthy that Tyler acknowledges yet again this strange part of people that live their lives solely to please other people, needing the validation and acceptance from others and actively changing or hiding real and true aspects of themselves in order to appear either more cool or likeable in the eyes of their peers. Tyler ends this verse off by comparing himself to the types of people he mentioned already on the track, saying that he doesn't need to wear his chains or grills constantly to reaffirm his status or worth as a person, and that staying away from these gang-related activities is important if you don't want karma to catch up with you. Tyler brings this karma up right towards the end, and is an important aspect to mention, as if you're indoctrinated and fed lies in order to get involved in gang culture, your past actions that you take within that culture will inevitably catch up with you, if you ever choose to move on from that kind of environment. He ends the verse off saying that if you have past actions that cause feelings of regret and guilt, and may end up getting you in even more trouble, the best thing you can do is look the other way and run away as fast as you can from them. There's also an outro performed by Chaz Bundick and Schoolboy Q, however they simply just end the track off saying that they don't care for the socially conscious black power rap lyrics. This brings us to a large transitionary moment in the album, as we get led to the song Find Your Wings, a theme that has been brought up several times on the album already. With all the observation and reflection Tyler has had on this album up to this point, we can feel that it's time for Tyler to finally follow up on his ambition and spread his wings, becoming the best possible version of himself, as well as the most artistically creative and free version of himself. This song, however, decides to tackle this transitionary moment in a more musical sense, as opposed to having it blatantly stated in the lyrics. Coming from the previous track into this one is a huge juxtaposition, with Run being a loud, booming banger, and Find Your Wings being a smooth, chilled out soul tune. Tyler has acknowledged that the radical and outrageous life he once lived is no longer to his taste, and it's time for him to reevaluate his goals and motives moving forward. The lyrics of the track of course relate heavily to the same idea of being your own person and not being afraid to follow the path that you personally want in your life. The chorus of the track simply repeats the phrase find your wings. However, looking at the first verse delivered by both Sid the Kid and Tyler, it's almost like Tyler is both talking to himself, but also the numerous other people whose vision is clouded by outside judgement and fear of failure. 
They ask, what are you doing and why are you running? Of course, relating back to the previous track, Run, and how Tyler was actively encouraging people who follow poor decisions and go down a bad path in life to eventually run from any kind of regret or guilt that may be thrown their way later in life, as well as just running away from the bad situation that they're currently in. However, in this track, it's asked why they're running, causing a confusing juxtaposition. As the verse continues, we can see that yet again, Tyler has dug even deeper into his psyche and re-evaluated his stance of self-belief and self-confidence yet again. They claim that instead of running, they should instead be flying and take control because they're the pilot quite literally saying that taking control of their own direction in life is the most essential and healthy thing to do when progressing as a person. It's then stated that flying is almost essential as Tyler is unable to swim, most likely a sentiment that represents staying in his ways, not maturing and not developing, leaving him suffocated in an environment that he doesn't really want to be in. If Tyler doesn't be who he wants to be and do what he needs to do, he's simply going to drown under the pressure and judgment surrounding his life, not becoming the incredible artist that he can really be. The chorus is then repeated once more until we're brought into another verse sung by Kaliuchis, a verse which is almost trying to tempt us into spreading our wings and flying by showing all the positives that come from doing so. She starts off by saying that we can go down to the rainbow, a sign of positivity and happiness, and also says that the high that we're currently on shouldn't get in the way of having our wits about us. This could be relating back to Tyler's more negative views towards drug taking that we saw in previous tracks. However, could also just be saying that no matter how euphoric and happy we may feel at any given time, that's no excuse to lose all sense of reason and knowledge. No matter what state you're in, common sense and appropriate considered thought should always be taken into account. The verse ends off saying that not just Tyler, but everyone has these wings that are capable of letting them fly away, being the person they truly want to be, and achieving great things. However, the greatest shame that is seen in most people is that they let these wings go to waste, running from their home in the sky and choosing a different path that isn't as good for them. This leads us into the title track, Cherry Bomb, arguably the most aggressive, distorted, and messy track we've seen on the entirety of this album. If you're watching this video, I'll assume that you've already listened to the album, so you'll understand when I say that the lyrics on this track are pretty much inaudible for the most part, only being able to catch certain words or phrases occasionally. I believe the reason for this was, much like how Pilot used its distortion to represent turbulence in an aeroplane journey, the relentless distortion on this track is used to represent the cherry bomb. When the track opens, very quietly underneath the booming bass drum and screeching guitar, we can hear Tyler say, I really made this song just so I could perform it. I don't even know what it means. It means something. This confused justification that Tyler makes here may have something to do with how he wasn't initially going to have verses on the track. Track. Although he eventually decided against this, Cherry Bomb was first just going to be an instrumental, with the bridge that is introduced later originally being the only lyrics that were going to be on the track. Going into the first verse, we once again see Tyler bigging himself up and believing in the art that he's creating. We can see this when he mentions people claiming that his flowers don't smell that good, even though to him they smell perfectly fine. This is of course a metaphor for everything Tyler creates, including his music, clothing and videos, and that no matter how his artistry may be perceived from an outside perspective, at the end of the day, to Tyler, it wouldn't matter if even his closest fans didn't like or appreciate what he's creating. Tyler's still going to keep going the direction he needs to go as he's already found his wings and is soaring, having a new outlook on life and a clear vision on what he wants to achieve. It's not just self-confidence Tyler has gained, it's self-awareness, knowing full well if he's taking something too far or has lost his vision, ambition or creativity in any capacity. This pretty much is the extent of what is said in this first verse, with the same ideas being reinstated in different lyrics. As I said though, although they're there, the lyrics aren't exactly supposed to be the meat of the track. Rather, the experience of this song lies mainly in its instrumental. In the pre-chorus, Tyler once again mentions being the pilot of the new school music scene, before leading into the chorus where he mentions tying a knot, kicking a chair and floating in the air, obviously referencing the act of hanging oneself. 
In relation to Tyler, we of course immediately think of the infamous Yonkers music video from his album Goblin. So mentioning this and ending off the chorus with It's Cherry Bomb, maybe Tyler implying that the meaning of the cherry bomb is an explosion of one's presence into the lives of numerous people. Let's not forget that the Yonkers music video was a huge part of Tyler becoming a known figure. Without it, he may not have reached the heights he currently has, or at least nowhere near as fast as he did. The Odd Future Collective were frequently described as exploding onto the rap scene with their fast-paced, intense, and ruthless personas. And all while this was happening, Tyler, like always, was simply staying true to himself and his vision, not pandering to anyone and constantly evolving. That's the cherry bomb. Not just the explosion of fame and respect within a certain scene, but also staying true to yourself and actively morphing when necessary, much like we've seen Tyler do on this album. This leads us to the second verse, which, just by looking at it, can yet again be seen more as just another layer to this overall distorted cacophony, as opposed to saying anything deep or meaningful. This type of production reminds me a lot of the band Death Grips, a band Tyler has mentioned before that he's been a fan of for a while. Most of what is detailed in this verse simply feeds into Tyler's confidence yet again, with him saying things like he's ready for a war if somebody wanted to throw shade his way, and that he doesn't need wealth or materialistic things to be happy. This leads us back to the pre-chorus and chorus, before then taking us to a bridge where Tyler repeats the phrase, fuck that, like this, that cherry bomb, building up until the song takes a complete tonal transition, with the last segment of the track being an extremely beautiful moment, where a melody cuts in between the distortion and the booming drums. The lyrical content in this final refrain mentions how Tyler doesn't want to be fired up because he loses control, although it does seem Tyler is starting to take control of his own emotions through the course of the album so far. As the song comes to a close, we can hear the sound of Tyler getting in a car and start driving, turning on the radio in the process. This is the introduction of the Golf Radio Station, the consistent concept that is held throughout the rest of this album. Whereas before, the album may not have seemed as conceptual as Tyler's previous works, the Golf Radio Station will stay a constant as we start diving into different ideas. Like Find Your Wings, this marks a transitionary point in this album, with styles switching up yet again. The radio says, they're playing only classic hits, leading us into the next track, Blow My Load. As we enter this track, we get thrown straight into the first verse, giving us another slow and smooth track, fitting in with the title of the track. Speaking of the title, according to Tyler, this song is based off a picture that he saw of Cara Delevingne, and Deadass was like, yo, I just want to eat her out. This is the first real diversion in a lyrical sense, as the majority of the time, Tyler has been more focused on aspects like ego, confidence, and maturity, whereas in this track, he's taking inspiration from previous songs in his discography like She and Her, and focusing more on a simple track focused on a girl that he likes. The song starts off with Tyler reminiscing on this person that he's previously slept with, saying that he wants this girl to truly believe that he loves her, and isn't just sticking around for any surface tier things like sex or just general company. Tyler thinks about this girl very often, mentioning that he thinks about little things that make him feel happy, like her windows, frequently. The rest of this first verse simply reinforces these emotions that Tyler is projecting, using clever wordplay saying that he's a kid from Africa and that this girl is a kitchen, comparing the stereotype of starvation associated with Africa with himself, and basically saying that he's dying to eat this girl. This takes us to the hook of the track, which is literally just Tyler saying that he wants to eat this girl out, film it, reminding some of his earlier fans of his song VCR, and hope that he doesn't blow his load inside this girl, causing a Tyler baby to be born. Quite a simple message, especially compared with some of the deeper topics Tyler has already touched on in this album, with those topics also being shrouded under metaphor most of the time. The second verse, much like the first, simply focuses on the things Tyler wants to do with this girl. Most mostly revolving around sex, sort of contradicting what he mentioned at the start of the track about loving this girl for numerous reasons, despite Tyler only focusing on one aspect of their relationship for the entirety of the track. The introduction of this love interest about halfway through the album is an interesting choice, as so far Tyler hasn't focused on these kinds of aspects for the entire record, and as we're going to see in the upcoming tracks, this is a theme that is going to stay consistent with a number of songs. We hear the hook repeated once more before the instrumental gets pared down even further, with the bass and vocals being the primary instruments that can be heard. 
The interlude towards the end talks about how this girl lights Tyler's firework, representing the happiness he feels with her, as well as linking back to the cherry bomb idea once again. In the outro, we hear Shane Powers for the second time on this album. This time, however, he's hosting the golf radio station. He mentions that the song we just heard was from the soundtrack from an upcoming film. However, before we can hear the title, a loud honk, presumably coming from Tyler's car, blocks out the name. Some people, including myself, have speculated that, much like like it's implied in the fucking young music video, the film that is being referenced is the Wolf Trilogy, consisting of Tyler's first three albums, Bastard, Goblin and Wolf, and the shared storyline they have between each other. This is further reinforced when Shane Powers mentions that it will be a triple feature, meaning three feature films are going to be shown. I've made a video on it previously, so if you want to check that out, a link will be in the description. The song ends by playing another golf radio transition, bringing us straight into the next track, Two Seater. This song starts bright and uplifting, a pattern that we've seen has emerged within the second half of the album. Tyler starts off the track saying that him and presumably the girl from the previous track can speed in his two-seater, perhaps referencing his well-known Bimmer, which he mentioned in Wolf. A car that is not in fact a two-seater, but a car that Tyler has shown relates to romance and love, as referenced in his song Bimmer. This leads us right into the first verse, where Tyler starts by mentioning that him and this girl would be travelling about 100 miles per hour down Fairfax which was the location of the Odd Future store which was set up by the collective and was closed around 2014. We can feel Tyler has a sense of pride in this car, saying that the car isn't just a stock model that he picked up and uses, implying that there are parts he has installed into the car that were put in after he bought it, in order to maximise its performance. We then see Tyler once again mention how he pretty much came from nothing to something, saying that he used to piss in a pot, but now because he doesn't care about things like wealth as much as he used to, he's just going to piss on the walls instead. As he goes on to mention, however, these type of outrageous antics from Tyler has landed him in hot water time and time again, as he then mentions how he pissed off a cop and got a couple tickets for speeding. This conflict with police isn't new, however, with Tyler infamously getting arrested on charges for inciting a riot in 2014, giving us arguably the greatest image of all time. As Tyler mentions, though, just like this new wealth allows him to piss on his walls, feeling a sense of freedom and empowerment, it also allows him to slide slightly bend the rules of the law, as he's always been able to pay these speeding tickets without any fear of being out of pocket, with Tyler even stating that by looking at his car, pretty much everyone knows this to be a fact. Tyler then goes more in depth with the description of the car itself, mentioning aspects like the age of the car, being an older classic model with an E92, having a Tiptronic gearbox making it a semi-automatic, as well as having good suspension, which Tyler refers to as being static. As we reach this ending part of the verse, he continues to use wordplay and rhymes while referencing different brands of cars, actively comparing the car that he uses with the cars owned by other people. This leads us back into the chorus, and then to a bridge where Tyler further describes the feeling he gets when he drives in this car with this girl. Also telling us that this girl tries to keep Tyler in check by telling him to slow down. But as Tyler says, because of the happy feeling he's experiencing, he's unable to slow down. The rush he gets when speeding in his car is unparalleled with anything else. And even then, the rush he gets can sometimes be even too much for him to handle. This brings us right to the second verse, where as opposed to the first, which was purely based on different types of cars, in this verse he intersperses lyrics referencing this girl, and the choices that he is advising her on. He starts by showing a slight insecurity within himself, warning this girl who he's obsessed with and thinks is perfect that there are lots of other guys who are going to envy her. However, unlike Tyler, these guys are the type to carry Rugers, meaning spears, and Shotters, meaning guns, meaning that they would be a bad influence on this girl, as opposed to Tyler who, despite being uncompromisingly himself, isn't dangerous, with no history of violence, and as we've seen, even stays away from things like drugs entirely. Tyler then becomes introspective once again, reflecting on his odd future days, comparing their activities to getting food at McDonald's. Not something that is extremely detrimental to your health, but constantly pursuing this lifestyle will inevitably affect someone's health and well-being. 
Tyler then states that he's a king and mentions the phrase Hakuna Matata, most well known for its appearance in the film The Lion King, with it meaning no worries. However, in the upcoming lyrics, we can see this can be contradicted, as Tyler mentions that if you fall into a narcissistic and egocentric mindset, much like a lot of his contemporaries within the rap scene, you will inevitably be swarmed by hyenas, simply looking for their piece of the pie, wanting their slice of fame, wealth, or maybe just attention. In the upcoming lyrics, we get an interesting moment where he seems to start reflecting on the creative process of his album Wolf. Firstly stating that the album cover for Wolf was most likely inspired by the logo for the NBA team, Minnesota Timberwolves. He also looks to fans, critics, and likely some of his friends' expectations for what Cherry Bomb was going to be whilst he was creating it, claiming that he bet some people who didn't like Wolf's heavier emphasis on quality chord progressions and catchier melodies, wishes that Tyler on Cherry Bomb would go back to focusing more heavily on his lyrics over the course of an entire album. An expectation that we can assume has been crushed by this album's release, with songs like Find Your Wings, Cherry Bomb, and even this song taking a larger focus on the instrumental compared to the lyrics. Tyler shows his evolution in these lyrics, even saying that he killed the dark shit, meaning his earlier music, which was renowned for its extremely dark tone and subject matter. However, for him as an ever-morphing artist, he needs to embrace this new, brighter, and happier direction that is found within this album. He ends this verse bizarrely talking about selling cocaine, referring referring to it by pounds, a brick, and also referring to the police as pigs towards the end. Making me think that this ending part is once again simply referencing his older work, where for a large part, Tyler wrote about these events that he would partake in that were simply a fantasy. A key example of this in fact being the song Pigs off of Wolf, a song where he talks about killing bullies and starting riots. We then get a short instrumental break with the introduction of a sax solo before being brought back for a short third verse simply capping off this segment of the song, implying to his longtime fans that with as much evolving and transforming that we've seen take place within Tyler, he still keeps a skateboard in the trunk of his car, showing that even though he's upgraded in every way, that hasn't mean he's forgotten where he's come from, with that part of him still being freely accessible if needs be. This takes us out of this part of the song, with all music being turned down with it being replaced by the sound of Tyler driving his car, and the girl complaining about Tyler not closing her window because of the wind. Tyler gets annoyed because she turned his music down, but once she retaliates complaining about the wind, he takes a step back and becomes more sentimental, saying that he wants to leave the window open because he loves it when her hair blows. This takes us to the next part of the track, which makes a large departure from what we saw in the first half, paring everything down at the start, creating a very chilled out and calming experience. During this part, Tyler simply repeats lines showing his infatuation with this girl, pretty much loving every moment he's with her and every action she takes, like hanging out of the sunroof with her hair blowing. He also mentions how this girl can sometimes be scared of taking a drive with Tyler, not just being a reflection on his driving ability, but also how wild he's now perceived as a person due to his past actions in his youth. This doesn't worry him though, simply saying that if she comes with him, she knows for a fact she'll have a good time. This brings us to the end of the actual musical part of the song, with the rest of this track showing us where Tyler and this girl were driving to, and that place is the Moon Theatres that was mentioned on the previous track, most likely going to watch that triple feature that Shane Powers had talked about. This part includes two of Tyler's friends, Lionel and Errol, who both start by talking to each other about push-ups before noticing Tyler, who presumably had just walked into the theater. Once they spot him, they immediately start insulting him, seemingly for no reason. However, once Tyler approaches them, they both stop the insults and instead start being nice to him. Tyler uses this moment as an opportunity to recognize the resentment that can stem from jealousy in relation to how people perceive you once you've gained some notoriety. However, because these guys are Tyler's friends, they keep up this fake attitude towards him, most likely knowing that Tyler is a nice enough person to help them out whenever they need, especially in relation to money. In this part, we also see the mention that the feature that is going to be shown is in fact Tyler's creation, further reinforcing the theory that the triple feature is the Wolf trilogy from his previous albums. The track ends off with both of his supposed friends going back to insult him once he leaves.
This leads us right into the next track, The Brown Stains of Dark East Latifah Part 6 to 12. With the insane title being something Tyler came up with at the last minute when writing the credits for the album, purely thinking it would be funny if someone were to come up to him in the street and have to say that this was their favourite song. This song takes a slight departure from what we've seen in the last two tracks, with Tyler returning to a more heavy and distorted sound, with the lyrics also following suit, serving as a more braggadocious venture once again. The song starts by going straight into the first verse, with Tyler asking countless rhetorical questions to an unknown entity. However, with the way he talks, once again about fucking bitches, incessant drug use and drug dealing, it's most probable that Tyler is talking about figures within the rap scene, as well as people involved with gang culture. He reinforces this heavily by not chastising these people's actions, but simply calling all of those activities bullshit, and saying that he doesn't need to do these things to do the things that he really wants to achieve. Tyler even says that he looks into a mirror and tells himself that he's the man, once again showing his confidence in becoming a more rational and level-headed adult, compared to that out-of-control kid that we saw for most of his career up to this point. As the verse continues, Tyler relaxes back into a confident and braggadocious mindset, talking about the gold chains he's wearing around his neck, and saying that his contemporaries within the rap scene have about 30 seconds before they see halos. I think this not only references the onslaught that Tyler's gonna bring up in the upcoming session, second verse, as he talks about reloading his ammo, most likely referring to the sheer ammunition of insults and shade that Tyler can throw their way, but I also think this is referring to these rappers' careers as a whole, with Tyler acknowledging the amount of rappers who have short-lived careers banking off of one popular song that they've created, their careers being a 30 seconds of fame type situation. As we enter the second verse, the track amplifies in every aspect, with the instrumental becoming increasingly distorted, with a whining, modulated synth being heard screeching in the back. Tyler starts the verse asking if he can get some chaos in his direction, whilst also claiming that he's the truth and the dare, once again showing Tyler's unrelenting attitude, with him essentially laughing in the face of stupid games like Truth or Dare, and saying that as opposed to doing one or the other, he'll just do both, because he doesn't really care about how anyone perceives him. He then mentions rapper Schoolboy Q, who also features on this track, before mentioning the golf brand once again and saying that they go harder than Jojo and Diggy. This references the rap group Team Blackout, which featured both Jojo and Diggy Simmons, implying that Tyler's crew go so hard that sometimes they black out. Tyler then mentions there being no ship in their series, because he pissed off Iggy, the word ship being used to represent a relationship that is encouraged by outside lookers, but contrasting that with some short-lived drama shared between Tyler and pop star Iggy Azalea. This conflict between both artists started when Tyler dissed her on the TV show 106 and Park, saying, and I quote, I don't want Iggy, she stink, she got shots in her dump, I want a real booty, you feel me? Naturally, Iggy Azalea didn't take kindly to that, writing in a since-deleted tweet, Tyler the Creator is beyond immature. I've always believed you had something more to offer the world. Shame to see you be so rude. This then led to Tyler apologising on Twitter, albeit quite sarcastically. Tyler then states that he's always been that kind of person to not care about people's perception of him, actively ruining any chance he would have with an artist like Iggy Azalea just because he thought it was funny to say some random stuff about her. He continues to mention how he wears Vans like a soccer mum, with this frequent attraction to the Vans brand obviously stemming from the partnership both Golf and Vans had, with the Golf Wang model of shoe. He then looks towards the Dodgers baseball team, talking about a family that went to a game and came out blue, referencing the violent reputation of Dodgers fans, with the blue colour being symbolic of being suffocated or beaten blue. This leads to the next lines where Tyler yells out, solve them, referencing himself and his rap collective, before then stating that it's impossible for Tyler to be stopped because of his sheer willpower. He also acknowledges here that he is, or at least used to be a problem for a lot of people, not only in the sense of opinions shared by onlookers, but also from what we can imagine, a problem for a variety of things like TV appearances, live appearances, and as we can see by Tyler's mugshot, a problem with the police as well. Tyler basically tells these people to keep their distance, otherwise they'll get fucked up like the thoughts inside his mind, implying that Tyler doesn't personally think he's well in a mental sense, or perhaps he's just buying into to the general perception of him being twisted because of the things he puts into his lyrics. 
He ends off the verse claiming that he feels two people inside one mind, or rather schizophrenic, most likely not genuinely meaning it, but perhaps referring to the numerous alter egos he's created throughout the course of his career. We also get the mention of Jim Crow in the final line of this verse, referring to the Jim Crow laws which segregated the blacks from the whites until the mid-60s, which in Tyler's case simply refers to him separating himself as far as he can from the types of people he's already established that he doesn't mess with. This leads us once again right into another verse, this one starting off with Tyler reaffirming the meaning behind his Jim Crow lyric, saying that he loves being dark skinned, and goes back to bragging once again, mentioning how he's only 23 and has got a house of his own. There's a contradiction that Tyler makes in the lyrics about wanting someone with diamonds on their neck to stay out of his business, while at the same time he's wearing his expensive cherry bomb chain around his neck. Maybe Tyler thinks his chain is acceptable because he made it himself in a collaboration with Ben Baller, seeing it more as a personal achievement as opposed to just trying to look cool. This pretty much runs throughout the rest of his verse, touching on several achievements that he's made in his career, like going from throwing up in the Yonkers video to throwing carnivals, referring to his Camp Flognor music festival. He also sets up Schoolboy Q's upcoming verse by mentioning how he's kinda loco, basically telling us that if listeners were blown away by Tyler's verses, just wait until you get to Schoolboy's. He ends the verse off once again mentioning the odd future store that the collective used to own on Fairfax Avenue in LA, but also mentions how the store has been shut down and taken from them. Tyler explained this in a tweet before the album came out, explaining that the owner of the building was no longer happy with the business they were bringing, or actions they were taking, so they had to move. This brings us crashing into Schoolboy Q's verse, starting off his verse brutally, saying that he's ruthless and hasn't got a problem with shooting a white guy if needs be. Q brings up gang culture, talking about the common tattoos that gang members tend to get in accordance with their gang, and mentions his gang-related upbringing by mentioning how the Orange Paisley got him going Crip crazy, representing Q's well-known association with the 52 Hoover Crips. He goes on with this same theme, talking about how his pants hang heavy and sag to the left because of the gun he's got strapped to him, the left side representing the west side Crips. He also mentions that when gangbanging, he doesn't want to wear a face mask to hide his identity, maybe to show others just how ruthless and also fearless he is as a person. This is of course ironic when looking at Q's music career, with him showing a pattern of hiding and covering his face on his album covers. He continues this merciless barrage of lyrics, saying he doesn't grieve over any of the people he's killed, with gunpowder still lingering on his knuckles from the gun he's just used on someone. Q states that he's from the era of crip walking, that phrase referring to a dance move which was established around the 1970s by crip member Robert Jackson, becoming a well-known dance move where one performs the act of quick and intricate footwork. Q acknowledges people from an outside perspective, watching people like him crip walking and trying to replicate that without being at all associated with any sort of gang culture. Q mocks these onlookers, saying that while he's got his style whilst crip walking, they're simply clown dancing. Q continues to reference the collaboration between himself and Tyler, referencing his label Top Dog Entertainment and Tyler's Wolfgang, before then calling anyone that is once again trying to either replicate or match the levels that him and Tyler are on to watch what they say and take control of their lyrics, with Q warning these people not to step out of line, otherwise they'll be met with a beating from him, whether that be audible or physical. Q ends this verse, as well as the track, by mentioning his lack of care towards any sort of laws that are in place, whilst having two bodies in the back of his car, with the car having a borrowed license to conceal any lead that would go back to him. He finishes off by telling the listeners that if you want to have a life like Q is describing, you're gonna have to bite the bullet and take huge risks. You'll need to become a hustler and overcome challenges, but the real question that you then have to ask yourself is, is it really worth it? <laughs> this brings us right into the next track, Fucking Young and Perfect. The song being a two-parter, with Tyler continuing the tradition between his albums where the tenth track is always a two-parter. Fucking Young brings us out of the intense, booming rhythms from the brown stains, and once again brings us back to a happier, slower environment. We can presume the person Tyler is talking about in this song is the same girl we've seen in the previous tracks. However, as we can see by the title, it seems like Tyler's not going to get what he wants out of their relationship, as 
as he starts to come to the revelation that this girl might just be too young for him to pursue. The intro tells us the first time Tyler set eyes on this girl, saying that the day that he met her, he knew immediately that the connection and chemistry they shared was something special. But he also states that despite being in Nirvana when spending time with this girl, he had to pretend like he wasn't, purely because if he did, he'd be perceived as weird and creepy by his friends. There's a little moment in this intro where we can also hear Tyler get annoyed at the fact he can't sing as well as he wants, once again showing us Tyler's evolution as an artist with this album really being his first real foray into singing, a trait of Tyler's that would be refined over his next two albums. We then get brought to the pre-chorus, an entire passage revolving around paranoia over the cops tracking him down and arresting him for being with this girl who's apparently below the legal age. Tyler details the intricate process of what he would do if a policeman were to knock on his door and ask him about the situation, saying that he could escape out the back door and run away, or maybe even answer the door and act willfully ignorant and confused about the situation. This takes us to the chorus, where Tyler reinforces this same message of the girl being perfect, but just too young for Tyler to pursue in good faith. He even states that he might be in love, but still can't bring himself to get into a relationship. This message being a somewhat similar conundrum to what we saw in the song I Fucking Hate You, where Tyler both hates and loves a girl, whereas here he loves her but can't love her. As we're brought to the first verse, we're shown just exactly how big the age gap is between Tyler and the girl, with Tyler saying there's a six year difference between each other. With Tyler being 23 at the time of writing this song, that would make the girl 17 years old, falling right in the middle of the bracket of legality that the US states legislate, being between 16 and 18. With Tyler being so paranoid, looking at the worst case scenario of getting 10 years in prison for getting into a relationship with this girl, it's understandable why he's being risky and starting to keep this girl at a distance. He also claims that this worry isn't just for his own personal reasons, but he doesn't want to disappoint the black community either, mentioning how if he goes to jail, the pigment on his skin will simply make him another statistic in the eyes of racists. As we come to the end of this first short verse though, he keeps it real with the girl, telling her that although this relationship most likely isn't going to work out, she does genuinely bring him joy, and fills a void in his mental that was missing previously. This leads to the pre-chorus and chorus being repeated once more, before bringing us into the second verse, where Tyler decides to take a heavier emphasis on rap. He starts this verse by once again establishing the age gap between each other, comparing different ages, almost like he's trying to convince himself of the weirdness of the situation. It seems like at this point he's trying to detach himself completely from this girl, saying that even when she turns 18 and it becomes definitely legal for Tyler to pursue her, he'll probably still end up running away and not chasing this relationship, purely because the experience he's had to begin with has already made him feel uncomfortable and self-conscious about doing anything with this girl. Tyler tells her that she should just find someone else, trying to convince her that he isn't the right person for her, and using his maturity as an example of this, stating that even though he's older than her, he's still growing up and developing himself. Piled on top of this, Tyler even believes that despite him being older, this girl's mentality is a much more mature one than his own, before stating that this would be even weirder for him, as he thinks people will look at their relationship and start thinking that Tyler needs some mental help like therapy. He also mentions that whereas before when Tyler and this girl would ask each other to hang out, when he thinks of hanging with this girl now, the only thought that comes to his mind is a tree and a bell, referencing being hung from a tree, with Tyler thinking he'll be lynched for his actions if he chooses to pursue this girl. Tyler goes on to say he doesn't want any relation with this girl anymore, however the inner temptations of his mind are conflicting with what he needs to do, showing us that despite Tyler's choice of choosing to not pursue this girl was definite, he still has thoughts about how their relationship could have panned out. He also acknowledges that the things he's saying are probably going to hurt this girl's feelings, causing shit to hit the fan, which Tyler says would be a bad thing, wanting to avoid any drama at all costs, and as he mentioned earlier, simply cut all ties from this girl, only with good intentions in mind. As we come towards the end of this verse, Tyler continues on the back and forth he's having within his mind, getting annoyed at himself for not being able to just drop the situation entirely, stating that he can run off but not completely leave. He clarifies that this is because he's finally found someone, or as he mentions, a goose that he likes. However, he knows for a fact that she wants to get into a relationship with him, and even implies that she'd want to have children with him, which as Tyler says is exactly the reason why he's running away and doesn't want 
want to get caught, because the situation's too weird for him to handle. He ends the verse off by saying despite all of this stuff happening, he still found his wings, showing that all of the drama surrounding this girl and their relationship still isn't going to slow him down and stop him from doing the things he needs to do. It's in my opinion, a very inspiring message which he's brought up time and time again throughout his career, most prominently in his song Pothole from Flower Boy where he again mentions the idea of him wanting to help people and their situation, however it can never sacrifice the path he's journeying himself. At some point, he always has to get up and start chasing his ambition, spreading his wings and flying. This ends fucking young, with Tyler in the outro recognising the irony of the situation yet again, by saying that by the time Cherry Bomb is released and the girl hears this song, she'll already be of legal age. However, as we saw previously in the track, this still doesn't sway Tyler one bit into getting into a relationship. This brings us to the second part of the track, Perfect, which shows us the duality of the situation, with the song featuring a duet between Tyler and Kaliuchis, representing this girl that Tyler is referring to in Fucking Young, and giving us perspective on her side of the situation. In the intro, Kali quite simply shows us that she's aware of Tyler's predicament, and is aware why he's worried about the situation, but at the same time still is saying that they could be more than just friends. As we enter the first verse, Kali starts questioning Tyler's philosophy, trying to understand Tyler's internal worries more closely. This stays true to what Tyler said about this girl being more mature than him, with her taking a more rational view on the situation, not panicking, but instead trying to understand just what exactly it is about the situation that he's most stressed about. However, it could also be argued that, because of her age, she may be slightly more naive and ignoring the bigger picture that Tyler mentions, referring to being another statistic of a black person being put into jail. Despite the girl not being thrilled about the situation because of her deep feelings towards Tyler, she acknowledges his genuine fear, and says that she'll take it upon herself to leave Tyler alone and wait a while, most likely until she's of legal age, and then come back to see if a relationship between both of them could work out. We of course know Tyler's view on this situation, with him saying previously that even when she is 18, he's not going to get into a relationship with her. Kali tries to convince Tyler that all of the appropriate answers are there for him to acknowledge and understand. However, as Tyler says, he's just too blind to see them. His opinion on the matter has already been set in stone, with his thought processes making him so stressed out that he wouldn't be able to enjoy the relationship at this point anyway. The verse ends off with the girl essentially showing off her age and naivety by saying, fuck them all baby, it's just you and me. A line which tells us that this girl was in general ignoring all of the things that were vital and important to consider, with Tyler being the polar opposite and painstakingly considering these things over and over in his mind. The track ends off with a final verse from Tyler, simply repeating the lines you're too fucking young, as well as acknowledging that the situation they found themselves in is tough, and hurts to talk or even think about. However, that doesn't mean Tyler's gonna go along with something he finds morally unjust. Money, money. This brings us to arguably the most hyped up track on the entire album at the time of its release, with the inclusion of not only just two of Tyler's biggest inspirations, but two of the most inspirational and groundbreaking rap artists of the modern era, Kanye West and Lil Wayne. Smuckers strays far away from what we saw in the previous track, sticking true to what Tyler mentioned way back on Death Camp, about this album essentially being an overall free listening experience, more akin to a collection of greatest hits, as opposed to a grand concept album. The song starts with a dark sounding piano, more akin to his old style and tone that we saw in Bastard and Goblin, which in fact is because this beat did spawn out of that time period. Tyler explained that he made the beat in 2011 for Jay-Z and Kanye's Watch the Throne album, however they never ended up using it. Tyler's vocals in the intro are mumbled and quiet, with him mentioning watching Freaks and Geeks and wanting to buy a new McLaren with the vertical doors, pretty much letting us know from the outset that this song will most likely be another venture into Tyler's self-confidence and braggadocious attitude. Before reaching the first verse, Tyler increases the volume on his lyrics, loudly stating that the reason he does the things he does is not at all because of money. Unlike a lot of rappers around him, everything Tyler creates is pretty much done purely from the artistic merit that comes from doing the creative things that he chooses to partake in. He tells these same money-focused people to not speak to him, because they aren't important enough to be worth his time. This brings us into the first verse, where Tyler starts off by alluding back to the Mountain Dew controversy he mentioned on Buffalo 
Buffalo, insulting Dr. Boyce Watkins, who was a large proponent in getting the advert removed, calling it arguably the most racist commercial in history. Tyler once again recognises his controversiality and compares it to leaving a hickey on someone's neck, which may seem like a strange comparison, however in the next lyric we see him also compare his controversiality to a HIV victim, saying that this is the reason why nobody's fucking around with him. Tyler next mentions how not just him, but the entirety of Odd Future got banned from New Zealand, with Tyler tweeting at the time saying, OF is banned from New Zealand again. They said we were terrorist threats and bad for the society. Tyler then elaborates on his thoughts here, saying that when he heard these things being said about him and his friends, he couldn't believe it, because the accusations seem so foreign to what they really represent. Obviously with Odd Future essentially becoming a global phenomenon by this point, the news that they were banned from New Zealand surely caused an uproar from the fans there, with Tyler acknowledging this and saying that although they may be banned from their country, they've obviously fucked up as a nation because they've still got people idolising over them. Tyler's touched on this similar sentiment before, however in a much more literal sense on his song Nightmare from Goblin, where he responded to accusations thrown at him for being a bad influence on children, simply saying that it shouldn't be Odd Future that is getting the blame because they're just creating art, but instead the parents who are allowing their kids to listen to this stuff that they classify as offensive or controversial. Tyler almost completely stops the song to let everyone hear his pure distaste towards Loud Pack and Snapchat. Loud Pack meaning a bag of strong smelling weed, and Snapchat being the social media app. He's already shown his distaste towards these things several times throughout the album, with him here simply reinforcing what he said previously, thinking that weed and drugs in general is detrimental in having one's eyes opened and following a path that is healthy, suitable and ambitious, whereas his hatred towards Snapchat stems from the culture that surrounds it and the people that buy into it, exposing people for their narcissism and ego, whilst also making them appear self-conscious and in need of validation just from the pure fact that they're posting things for the sole purpose of getting likes or follows. In the next lines, much like he said on Death Camp, Tyler has a lot of confidence in Cherry Bomb as an entire musical piece, braggingly saying that Cherry Bomb is the greatest album since the days of sound, of course being an exaggeration, however doesn't take away from Tyler's confidence in the album, with him rarely ever commenting on the quality of his albums outside of his music, let alone in actual songs. This genuine sense of confidence in his creation that we see in Cherry Bomb is very much a unique part of this album, and strays away from what we've seen Tyler write about before in his lyrics, usually revolving around dark or personal subject matter. As we reach the end of this first verse, Tyler caps it off essentially saying even the sky isn't the limit because he's constantly raising the stakes of his potential as an artist, as well as also saying to his mother that he stayed true to a supposed promise of moving out of Section 8 housing and moving into luxury housing with the money he's gained from his success as a musician. He ends his verse by clarifying the level he's now at, not only in the music scene, but in society in general. It's now undeniable that Tyler is a global icon, and as a result, he's reaping the benefits, and the most important ones for Tyler aren't just money, but getting to work with people like Kanye and Lil Wayne. Speaking of Kanye, we're then brought to a bridge sung by him, throwing shade at the shoe brand Nike for how they approach their business, with athletes being their primary focus when it comes to partnerships, whereas Kanye signed with Adidas in late 2013. This brings us to the second verse, wrapped entirely by Kanye. Starting off, we immediately get the notorious controversiality from someone like Kanye, claiming that he's richer than white people with black kids, referring to the tendency celebrities have to adopt children from poverty-stricken countries such as Africa. Whether this is done to reflect well on the celebrities, or simply to help these downtrodden people is for you to decide. He then states that he's also scarier than black people with ideas, implying that racist people in a position of power don't just have a distaste towards black people coming up with creative or popular ideas, but are actively worried at their potential and want to shut them down. Kanye continues to talk about his unpredictable nature as an artist, but also implying by saying that Michael Jordan will be at his wedding, that like Jordan, he believes that he is truly the best in the rap scene, much like how Michael Jordan was seen at the best in basketball whilst in his prime. Kanye then tells us that he's been called crazy throughout his entire career. However, in his eyes, this has always been seen as people being closed-minded and just not believing in his ability, despite him time and time again proving them wrong. Kanye then uses two American 
American football players as a metaphor to once again represent the constant racism that he must have experienced during the course of his career. Putting himself in the shoes of Marshawn Lynch and saying that if you were to lynch him whilst Tom Brady was throwing to him, they'd drop the ball, putting them at a disadvantage. In relation to Kanye, he's referring to the impact he's had and still has within the rap scene, still being one of the biggest artists. And if he were to be cancelled or shut down by the media, the backlash would be so huge that it wouldn't even be worth it. This doesn't make Kanye perfect though, with him acknowledging the mistakes that he's made in the past, and says that even though these mistakes have happened, it was a necessary experience for him to develop further as a person. And even in spite of these mistakes, he's only managed to grow more successful and artistic as time goes on. As the verse continues, it seems race is playing a large part in what Kanye is choosing to speak on, claiming that he knows certain white people are almost closeted racists, too fearful to wear their beliefs on their sleeves, but instead, as Kanye mentions, saying things to their kids such as not to bring back their friend Jerome, referencing the sitcom Martin, with the character Jerome being played by black comedian Martin Lawrence. He also mentioned this same character Jerome on his song Bound 2. It's almost like Kanye is trying to inspire these young black kids who may be experiencing these unfair hardships like racism by using himself as an example, saying that he is the light and the beacon for these kids, showing the world what the black community are capable of. As we come towards the end of his verse, he starts mentioning his status and notoriety outside of the music world, almost bragging that an established university like Oxford is asking him to deliver a lecture to what we would perceive as very intelligent students. He ends the verse off talking about his rise within the music scene, first saying that he studied all of the proportions that added to his success, almost reflecting on the things he was doing around the time he was working on the college dropout. This would explain the Lexus lyrics Kanye just performed, as Kanye's infamous near-death car crash was in a Lexus. He said that around this time, his emotions were running at autobahn speed, with an autobahn being a highway system which has no speed limit, which in Kanye's case shows us how out of control his emotions were with them being overall more circumstantial and ever-changing. He finally mentions that around the time of the car crash, he was fearful of his life, which made him feel a lot closer to God, most likely because it was unsure at the time if he was even going to survive. He uses the metaphor of God telling him to go extra hard to represent his spark and ambition that inspired him to go forward with the college dropout, inspiring a whole generation of upcoming rappers like Tyler. After Kanye's verse, Tyler repeats the lyrics we saw in the intro, almost like the song's about to come to a close. But just as we start to relax, we're led into the second half of the track, which almost explodes onto the scene, with Tyler even saying, hold your horses, letting us know that we're not finished yet. This brings us to the third and final verse, performed by both Tyler and Lil Wayne. Tyler starts off by mentioning people who thought he lost it, most likely referring to the musical direction he's taking on this album, which is admittedly a large jump from his previous work, and acknowledging that there are people and fans around him who are probably thinking that he's losing direction, as opposed to broadening his sound. Lil Wayne then gets introduced, bringing with him his braggadociousness in full force, also telling everyone to hold their horses, before giving us some quite surface level lyrics about also being seen as a king within the rap scene. Much like Kanye, Wayne believes that when he comes out with music, it's almost like a domino effect, where he knocks down his competition one after one just because he's on another level compared to them. Tyler then gets brought back, comparing his rap collective to another collective called the Hot Boys, which Lil Wayne was a part of from 1997 till 2001. The sheer fact that Tyler is comparing himself to them of course shows that he holds them in high regard and even says in the next line that Hot Boys ruled from the 99 and 2000, meaning the years 1999 and 2000, but it's almost like the torch has been passed to the Golf Boys, who Tyler says have started ruling between 1-4 and 1-5, meaning 2014 and 2015, the period of time when the album was being made. Tyler continues to talk about having so much drive and motivation, using the metaphor of cars and driving once again, saying that he needs 10 lanes of his own to drive on, just for the sheer amount of creativity and ambition that's within himself. He also takes a note out of Kanye's book, as he claims that if you're trying to find another rapper or artist in general that puts out stuff that's as quality as what Tyler's producing, you're not going to be able to find one, because Tyler believes in himself that he truly is a god within the music scene, making him unparalleled 
and powerful compared to everyone else. This leads to Wayne jumping back on the verse, mentioning this time how he's got a wise trigger finger placed on a dumb nine, meaning a gun, using wordplay to convey how Wayne sees himself as a leader and having control over the rap scene, with the gun being represented as a follower. He also mentions that his middle finger is blind, showing us how in Wayne's eyes the idea of judgement and grudges is lost on him, purely because he's already started off with the attitude of fuck everyone. Wayne then goes on to mention his incessant drug use, showing us Wayne's almost complete contrast to Tyler's straight edge mindset, by saying that the Adderall that he takes is almost like an alarm clock, because he feels like he needs it in order to be awake and just function normally on a day to day basis. Wayne has a few more lines mentioning how the stakes are high due to his place within the rap scene now, with him having to be more cautious with his actions, before Tyler re-emerges on the track, starting off by talking about the things he's doing and is now able to do that he's essentially a world famous star. He first mentions how him and Kanye are doing things like hitting on models in clubs and compares their actions in a club to the basketball player Tony Parker, who infamously ended up with an eye injury from a bottle that was thrown at him during a feud between Chris Brown and Drake in a nightclub. Staying consistent with the basketball theme, Tyler also mentions how people are ducking people like him because of the fact that he's black, and gives a satirical shout out to Donald Sterling, the former owner of the LA Clippers, who ended up getting banned from the NBA for life due to some racist outbursts. This is of course telling us Tyler's view on the overall media landscape however, feeling that someone like Donald Sterling is simply an idiot who wears his racist views on his sleeve, whereas all the other people who share Sterling's same views simply think it to themselves, never letting their views to be known to the public in fear of something detrimental happening in their career, Donald Sterling being a great example. In this run up to the end, Tyler starts going through the process of explaining how black people have been treated throughout time, with the racism nowadays simply being masked under different layers despite still being present. When Tyler mentions how black people would have been hung from trees with nooses, he also inserts the line where the money grow, making me think that Tyler's taking a broader view on the subject and trying to discuss how despite these kinds of events rarely taking place in terms of today's standards, these powerful racist figures will still find a workaround to fuck over the black community, which in this generation is usually taking away their money and chances of success, simply because they don't like their skin colour. Tyler continues to use wordplay to his advantage, next saying that he's trying to hang like Mr Cooper or Jews in Berlin, of course referring to the extreme torture and execution of Jews during the holocaust, but also contrasting that with the light hearted TV show Hanging with Mr Cooper. He continues to mention the lynchings that have taken place in states like Alabama, with him mentioning the city Birmingham in particular. This would probably be due to leader of the civil rights movement Martin Luther King's link to the city, with him leading a peaceful campaign as an attempt to integrate black and white people. As this took place in 1963, racism was still rampant, with the protest being met with a large amount of resistance from racist white people who saw it taking place. Tyler then takes the attention away from this and focuses back on himself, giving us some confusing lyrics about how he might want to team up with the people that hate on his work, because because apparently Tyler doesn't particularly like his work either. This huge juxtaposition shows Tyler's disillusionment of the media industry. With so many different opinions and ideas constantly flying around, he's starting to lose his belief entirely and starts doubting his own ability. As Tyler seemingly starts going into a tangent about how terrible he is, he gets cut off by Wayne, simply saying that Tyler needs Jesus, or rather, in Tyler's atheistic case, some beam of positivity or hope that will get him through his days. However, Wayne also acknowledges that despite Tyler needing Jesus in his eyes, he's gone on tour with Jesus, referring to Kanye and his well-known tour of his album Jesus. The song ends with Wayne trying to help Tyler identify his motivation, claiming it's not monetary gain or fame, with Tyler replying at the end that his motivation is golf wang, referring to his brand as a whole. This leads us into the penultimate track, Keep the O's, a song featuring arguably Tyler's biggest inspiration, as mentioned previously in the album, Pharrell Williams. The song's title refers to keeping an ounce of cocaine, with him referring to himself in the intro as Mr. Treat Your Nose, a name which we last saw brought up in his song 48 from Wolf. Tyler in this intro also uses a double entendre with the word key, referring to keys which open doors, whilst also referencing the shorthand term for a kilo. 
We can assume with Tyler's straight edge mindset and distaste to drugs and drug dealing, he's taking a fantasy sort of angle on this track, implying that he takes the O's that he apparently gets for half price from a dealer and sells them for a higher price to someone else, making him more powerful and wealthy. We get brought into the first verse rapped by Pharrell, who we can notice has had his voice pitch shifted upwards significantly, most likely implying that Pharrell was playing the role as someone who's just snorted some of the O's that Tyler has supplied. His lyrics simply reinforce this idea, starting off with seemingly random and jumbled up phrases to represent the whacked out state someone under the influence of drugs can find themselves in. He also mentions how he's got a yellow Pac-Man on his finger, referring to the type of yellow ecstasy pill that has the Pac-Man character emblazoned on it. Pharrell then goes to a much smoother flow in his lyrics, compared to his very static, staccato flow at the start, mentioning people who blow their purple, meaning weed, and go in circles, maybe like Tyler, referring to people who use drugs as a form of escapism and constantly use them without doing anything meaningful or creative in their lives. He then begins to throw out these very esoteric lines, which I personally interpret as him saying that in order to reverse this cyclical inertia process that he mentioned, you have to first reverse it, meaning to stop smoking and become more of what Pharrell says is an open curtain, or rather a more open and free person, not being held down by any outside forces. Only after you do this and have full belief and confidence within yourself will you be able to become the golden person that Pharrell mentions. This ends his verse, bringing us back to the hook once more before leading us into the second verse which is rapped by Tyler, which he in fact states is probably his favourite verse on the album, saying that it's because he talks about his own ego. He starts the verse off using the metaphor of a garden, saying that someone's garden is full because they're raking hoes, obviously using the double entendre of hoes meaning a watering hose and a prostitute, but also having the garden be a metaphor, most likely representing either someone's time or focus, putting less emphasis on the creative and good things in life and instead focusing on the bad. Tyler then once again starts comparing himself to others, acknowledging his wealth when talking about his handful of green and couple stones, representing the money and jewellery that he owns, but also shuts down these posers who try to act like they're on his level by asking them how much of their house they actually own, with Tyler being able to buy his house in full, with these other people that he's talking to having to rent their house, despite still trying to act like they're as successful as Tyler. This is where we start to see Tyler focus on his own ego, as he proceeds to talk about how he doesn't compromise on anything, and especially nothing related to his art. He also says that he recognises the accomplishments he's made in his career, and doesn't really care about anyone else's opinion on the situation, even telling people to keep their compliments to themselves, because he's already got the confidence and self-belief. In the second half of the verse, we can really see where Tyler mentioned talking to his own ego, personifying it, and essentially mocking it. Firstly stating that when he does these kind of outrageous antics and stunts, he's acting like Evil Knievel, the well-known American motorcyclist who performed dangerous stunts. Tyler acknowledges that it's his own ego that takes hold of him when doing these things, as he only does them in hopes that other people will see it and react. And as he mentions in the next line, the results may vary, both meaning whatever stunt he does might be noticed or ignored, as well as being liked or hated. This isn't particularly the path Tyler wants to follow however, attempting to remove his ego and separate himself from it, saying that he'd much rather like to go for a calm bike ride, as opposed to speeding and potentially crashing a sports car like a Bugatti. Tyler then brings us back to the garden metaphor that he mentioned at the start of the verse, this time saying that people should keep their eyes open and never let their guard down because he's realised through building his career and having to interact with people who just want to use him to either gain fame or wealth, that this happens a lot and could result in bad things being thrown in your direction, or as Tyler says, it could start killing your flowers. As the verse ends, Tyler mentions Kanye's song New Slaves, a song which refers to artists as being the new slaves to big corporations and labels, with Tyler looking at it with a more broad view, with him saying that despite this new slave mentality being very real, people are being willfully ignorant and still going along with their shady practices. He focuses more on this in the final line where he mentions how everyone's got the whips but no drive, telling us that all of the people who are complaining about the current state of American society and how artists are being treated are essentially hypocrites, because they perpetuate this slave mentality by constantly funneling their own money back into these large corporations. This brings us back to the hook and then to a bridge, pretty much repeating all the things he's already mentioned in the track up to this point, with Tyler also introducing the encouraging message of finding your wings once more. 
Right at the end of the track, we hear Tyler question what he's just done over the course of this track, questioning what's gotten into him because he's talking about diamonds, cars, and money. This is appropriate, as Tyler has had this constant contradiction throughout a lot of this album, claiming that he hates materialistic things and areas like gang culture and drug use, but then goes on to talk about them in further detail, and sometimes even idolizing them. What we are witnessing is essentially Tyler's process of finding his wings, or rather, finding what he finds to be meaningful in life, and filtering those positive things out from all the negative stuff that he really has no interest in talking about, yet still has up to this point simply because of factors like his ego. This leads us into the final track of the album, Okaga CA. Firstly, the title of the track refers to the Okaga Lake that is located in Montana. However, having it followed by CA, meaning California, it could show that Tyler wants to move away from Okaga to California. When I personally think about this, I think this might be symbolic of Tyler once again saying that he wants to move away from a certain sound and broaden his sound. Looking at the real life Okaga Lake, many comparisons have been drawn between this location, broad and surrounded by trees, and paired it with the environment we found ourselves in with his album Wolf. This album cover in particular looking like a very similar environment. If we assume this is Tyler saying he wants to move away from this location to a new one, it might be him saying that he wants to not just be stuck down to a certain sound that he was employing on his previous albums, as well as once again maturing as a person. Tyler starts the track with a similar sentiment, with the first verse being about how he just wants to run away with this girl, who we can assume is the same one from all the previous tracks. From the lyrics we see in this verse, we can assume Tyler has relaxed his panic that we saw in Fucking Young, and has instead opted to just move away from all of the things that are causing him paranoia and stress, putting this girl at the top of his priorities. It's almost like Tyler's feelings have completely overtaken him, saying things like how his heart skips a beat whenever he sees this girl, and as we enter the chorus, he goes even further with this sentiment, almost like he's trying to convince this girl how important she is to him, so that she'll decide running away with Tyler is the only way to appropriately move forward in life. As we enter the second verse, our suspicions are gradually starting to be confirmed about the title and its deeper meaning, as he says that his motive is in fact to move to California, hurriedly asking the girl to pack her bags. I believe this song, more than anything, is truly showing the culmination of Tyler's evolution, with him now saying confidently that he's found his wings, meaning that he's found his ambition, and is moving away from his older style of musical creation and tone, because he's just naturally wanting to be as creative as possible, and not restrict himself to a certain sound just because his fans or label want him to. It's these kind of messages that are heavily inspiring, and make us understand things like why Tyler thinks Buffalo is not only the worst track on the album, but one of the worst tracks he's ever made. In Buffalo's case, it hasn't really got anything to do with how good the track actually sounds. It's purely what the track represents that I believe Tyler despises, as he looks at the song solely as a way to pander to fans, critics, and the music industry as a whole, essentially buying into his own hype and public image. We then see a back and forth between Tyler and the girl, with him saying that he knows this girl is ready to move on in life by Tyler's side. However, the girl once again proves her maturity, responding by saying that she knows for a fact that although she's ready, Tyler isn't. She knows he's basically putting on a front, acting brashly, thinking it will make him feel better and less worried about the age situation we saw in Fucking Young. Tyler almost confirms her observations in the next line, saying that although he is still worried under the surface, he now starts to rationalise the situation, saying that nobody has to know, and even if they did, they wouldn't even care anyway. He ends this verse off by telling her he doesn't want to waste their afternoon worrying about these problems, because he wants to fly with her to the moon. An optimistic idea, showing us that Tyler is now fully excited to bring this girl along for the grand journey that he's got planned for them. This leads us back to the chorus, before bringing us to the third verse which is performed by Alice Smith and Leon Ware, with Tyler being absent. However, it seems that the lyrics are still conveying the conversation between Tyler and this girl, with the bulk of the verse being the same as the first, with Tyler trying to not only convince the girl to leave with him on a grand journey, but also that he's not scared of being seen with her anymore. This leads us right into the fourth verse, where Tyler starts detailing the lustful process that him and this girl are going through, starting off by mentioning how she's sucking on his ears. A weird lyric, however, I think it's referencing a previous lyric from his song Awkward, where he also mentions how a girl plays with his ears when in a lustful state. 
The extent of Tyler's love towards this girl is really shown in this final verse, claiming that even though she can't tell, he's constantly blushing when around her because he's nervous and self-conscious in the presence of someone he really respects. It's almost like Tyler enters an audible montage here, as he starts listing off all the things that they either have done or are going to do together, like laying on a trampoline and looking up at the stars, with Tyler's arm becoming dead because the girl's head is resting on it. Tyler can't believe the situation he's found himself in, and he's extremely excited about it, almost rushing to tell us the kinds of emotions he's experiencing and the things they've been doing with each other. As we climb towards the end of the verse, Tyler almost mocks all of the other partners that he's previously been with, saying that they weren't special to him and they're annoyed because Tyler is taken now. He also states that because of the emotions that this girl has made him feel, he's become tired of everything else in his life and only wants to focus on their relationship, saying that he's sick of Earth and metaphorically wants to detach himself from it by flying to the moon, which will be much easier for Tyler as he's found his wings. This brings us to a bridge where the line let Let's go to the moon is repeated frequently, with Tyler's excited emotions being shown in full force. This then leads us to the outro of the track, where we see the moon idea in fact have two meanings, one of course being the metaphorical detachment Tyler wants to make between him and the Earth, but also the re-emergence of the moon theatre that we last saw be mentioned in the track Two Seater. In this outro, the girl continues to encourage Tyler to get moving and basically start a new life solely with her, leaving everyone else behind. The song ends with Tyler telling everyone to shush, saying it's about to start, presumably starting his triple feature that was being shown at the Moon Theatres. We never hear any audio to represent the movie that was going to be shown. However, if we're assuming the triple feature is the Wolf Trilogy, we already have those albums to go back and listen to whenever we want, perhaps making this film idea a form of reflection. With Tyler finally finding his wings in this album and taking a new direction, this triple feature serves as a reminder for a certain period of time, letting Tyler reflect freely on it and truly appreciate it for what it was, and then moving forward to do bigger and better things. This brings us to the end of Cherry Bomb, and upon reflection, I can see exactly why it was his most controversial album at the time of its release. I can see that people must have been shocked by the sheer jump in direction that Tyler makes. However, I think Tyler was completely aware of this reality when making the album, due to the sheer amount of lyrics upon analysis that references Tyler finding his wings and going in a new and more ambitious direction, as well as all the instances where he bigs himself up, and almost calls listeners stupid if they think what he's created is considered to be bad by them. Anyways, that's it, Cherry Bomb, what I consider to be one of Tyler's most misunderstood and brilliant projects. I hope you guys enjoyed my analysis, and if you like the video and want more like this, a like, subscribe, and a comment, as well as turning on notifications to keep you updated on when I upload, will be hugely appreciated, and supports the channel immensely. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.